Hallelujah. Good to be together today. Welcome to all of you that are here in the Regina location and in the Moose Jaw location. God bless you. I'm looking forward to feasting in God's presence together. I'm looking forward to being uh, just uh, feasting in His Word today. Why don't we just take an opportunity to pray uh, before we dive into His Word. Father, we thank You for Your Word, that it is spirit and it is life and health to all of our flesh. That Your Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And Holy Spirit, You're here to minister and to watch over the Word, to perform it in our lives. Lord, we are not passive. If that's your desire, maybe even just open your palms to the Lord. It's a symbol of just opening your heart to the Lord. Lord, we don't want to be passive in hearing your word today. We want to be embracing, Holy Spirit, of what you would say and want to do in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Today's message is titled Breakthrough in Thanksgiving. Just a couple of weeks ago, I felt the Lord just so deeply impress this on my heart when we were in Friday night prayer. And um, I'm really looking forward to unpacking it with you this morning. I believe that as I share this word prophetically with us this morning, uh, and as it is as it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, it'll help deal. Many people today are dealing with anxiety and fear. And this uh, kingdom principle that we're talking about today, breakthrough in thanksgiving, actually isn't just an antidote. It's actually what God wants us to step into so that we can be uh, free from anxiety, free from fear. You know, sometimes where it gets confusing for us as believers is often we see real things around us that aren't good. But you know, when those things have our attention, actually it takes us into a place where we're focusing on what the enemy is doing instead of recognizing that God's given us, as the scripture says, wings like eagles, that we rise above like eagles do above the jet stream and actually see it from a heaven's perspective. In the beginning of this year, fasting and prayer at the beginning of this year, um, one of the words that the Lord spoke very clearly um, was it was two words, alignment and breakthrough. Alignment and breakthrough. When we spend time fasting and seeking God, when we spend time in His presence and in prayer, He will speak to us. And there was a very clear word that came forward as we become aligned with the Lord. This is a year to become aligned with God. This is a year to deal with some of those maybe hidden unforgiveness issues. This is a year to have people are, people are having different areas of their lives, even as I've heard just so many testimonies over the last few weeks of people becoming aligned with God, even in how they see the finances that the Lord has entrusted to them and how they're experiencing then breakthrough. God wants us to be aligned in our lives, and as we are aligned with Him, we are positioned to experience breakthrough. And they were uh, two words that came forward as we were fasting and praying uh, at the start of 2024. You know, there's tremendous power in your words in the things that you say. There's tremendous power. Do you realize that there are angels and demons watching you all the time? And they are one of the things they're watching for is they're watching for the things that you and I are saying and doing because it actually determines who's able to carry out their assignments. See, God is all powerful. The, the victory has already been won. But actually, we have to establish that victory in our lives. And that's why as we become aligned with the Lord, we don't have to, we don't have to fight in the same way that you think fighting. Actually, when we're aligned with the Lord, it's simply we, we stand in the authority and the victory that God's given us. How we speak and our actions actually are, are a determination of whether, and I'm not trying to be over-spiritual here today, but when you look at the Scriptures and you see the very clear and large windows that the scriptures give us into the spiritual realm. Both uh, angels and demons are watching us all the time. And they are, depending on what we say and what we do and who we're aligning with and who we are aligning with in our words, actually determines which one angels or demons are able to carry out the assignments that they've been given. One assignment is from heaven. One assignment is from hell. 
I know that sounds strong this morning, but it's a reality. And many people cannot figure out why they're walking under oppression, why they're walking in fear. They are oblivious sometimes, or we walk even as Christians with kind of a, an absent-mindedness of the very real, real spiritual realm. And as we become aware of what the Lord has shown us in His Word about the spiritual realm, and we begin to cooperate with heaven in our words, in our actions, breakthrough is waiting for us. That fear can break in your life. That anxiety can break in your life. That oppression can break in your life. In fact, the victory's already been won. And today we're talking about how to establish that. Verbally expressing thankfulness. I want this to be practical today. Verbally expressing thankfulness and choosing to rejoice aligns you with heaven. I believe that as we look into a few of the scriptures we're going to look at here, it is clear that joy isn't just an emotion or something we feel. It's an essential kingdom principle that we need to choose to apply in our lives for a number of reasons. And one of the reasons is it's a key piece in spiritual warfare. Sometimes even people, and I, I would consider myself to a certain degree to be someone who um, intercedes an intercessor I spend quite a bit of time praying and interceding but you know many people do that even even in their intercession they're doing it with such a heaviness they're doing it from this place where the enemy looks so large and actually that's not the kingdom way the kingdom of God is righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Spirit and as you step into that you go into rooms and you just turn the lights on you go into rooms and you just as you, we align with heaven we just walk in the victory that God's given us Today, I want, to, I want us to grab a hold of very practical ways that we can actually establish that in our lives. <clears throat> and worship and thanksgiving is actually very much spiritual warfare. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, the Holy Spirit inspires Paul to write this, whatever happens. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. And then he says this, I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Many people today, they get going down a wrong track. They love the Lord, but they get going down a wrong track. They don't stay in this place of thankfulness. See, we're not thankful for everything, okay? Because there's things that the enemy is doing. I'm not thankful for that. But in the midst of that, I will be thankful. In the midst of this circumstance, I will be thankful. In the midst of this circumstance, the enemy will not have the last say because I'm going to align myself with the Lord with a joy and a thanksgiving. And as I begin to declare that, when I begin to actually be thankful to the Lord in the midst of those circumstances, you see, Paul was writing to the Philippians. Well, it was actually just not that long previous to this that Paul was in jail in Philippi. He had been sent to jail unjustly, for helping set free a young girl that was actually under demonic influence. And in that place, as they began, you know the story, we've talked about this, as they began to worship in the jail, it was about midnight, Scripture says, Paul and Silas began to worship. And it says the very foundations of the prison shook, and actually all the doors opened and their chains fell off. Paul's reminding them, it's worship in the midst of oppression and things that are unfair. Are there things that seem unfair in your life? Has the enemy come against you in some way? As I read what happened to Paul throughout his ministry life in the book of Acts, there's no question in my mind that it was the enemy that was trying to take him out. It was the enemy that was coming against him. It was the enemy in the midst of this because they not only were thrown in prison, the Bible says their backs were laid open as they were beaten with rods. That's the enemy's work. It's not God's work. Is there things that feel like they've come against you in your life? Paul reminds the Philippians, he said, whatever happens to your brothers and sisters, 
as you rejoice in the Lord, he says, I don't get tired of telling you this because it safeguards your faith. It safeguards your faith. He goes on to say in Philippians chapter 4, same book. He's writing, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18, always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances. Not for everything. We're not thankful for oppression. We're not thankful for abuse. We're not thankful for financial things that are coming against us. We're not thankful for those things, but in the midst of that, we are thankful in all circumstances. It says this, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Why is it God's will? Because as you are in the middle of circumstances where you need to choose to be thankful, and for me this week, there certainly was those opportunities, things that are difficult, and I chose to worship. I chose to be thankful. You see, when we're worshiping here in service, when we are singing and raising our hands to the Lord, to me, that is not just some sort of outward thing that we can all get kind of worked up emotionally. And I'm really, it's got nothing to do with that. Worship and thankfulness is spiritual warfare. Some of us in our homes, when we feel like our minds are kind of swirling and the things going on around us are very real and very hard, can I encourage you? Lift your hands and begin to be a worshiper. Lift your hands and begin to thank God. God, before I see the answers, I'm going to thank you. Lord, before I see this situation shift in my family, in my kids, in my finances, I am going to be a worshiper. I am going to release heaven in this circumstance. It glorifies Jesus and it brings brings God's will into that situation. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong in Christ Jesus. You see, joy is a catalyst for kingdom living. And God wants you and I to experience kingdom living. Well, what does that mean? Well, actually... Romans chapter 14, verse 17, the second part of that verse tells us what kingdom living is. Very simply, righteousness, which is right standing with God because of Jesus, the cross. Right standing with God. The kingdom of God, it says, is righteousness. You can pull that verse up, or maybe I didn't actually put it on the screen. Romans 14, 17, if you want to write it down. This is kind of an overarching statement about what actually the kingdom of God is. And it says this, it is righteousness, right standing with God, peace, peace. The whole world is looking for peace. And it's joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what kingdom living is. Righteousness, peace, and joy. It's not perfection. None of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. But we come to the cross. We ask forgiveness. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. You know, God wants each of us to experience that. And today I have felt the Holy Spirit prompting me to share and remind us of one of the key ways to see that released in our lives. One of the key ways to see anxiety broken in our lives. One of the key ways to begin what happens is we worship and are thankful. It washes our eyes to actually accurately see how do we proceed in this situation. How do I respond to this very complicated uh, circumstance at work? How do I respond to this person who has got the gift of irritation? Thankfulness washes our eyes. If you've got somebody in your life like that, that has the gift of irritation, that has not been delivered from the gift of irritation, I want you to do this, okay, very practically. Make note of five things that you're thankful for, for them. Now, that might sound like a lot. I want you to write down five things, and I want you, in your own time, to begin to verbalize those things. Lord, thank you for this in this person's life. Thank you for how you're working in their life. What'll happen if you're willing? What'll happen is God will then begin to give you things to declare over them. Some of the people that are close to us that are doing things they shouldn't be doing. If you and I don't actually begin to thank God for them, if you and I actually don't begin to, with thanksgiving, make our requests known, if we don't begin to declare these things over them, who's going to? 
Heaven is simply looking. And when I say heaven, of course, the will of the Father, just as it says in the Lord's Prayer, being done on earth. The angels that have been sent, Scripture tells us in Hebrews they are sent to minister on behalf of the heirs of salvation. That's you if you know Jesus. Demonic spirits as well. And I'm not trying to be overly heavy or dramatic this morning. I'm just telling you the way it is. Demonic spirits want to stir up that angst and that anger and that complaining. And you have to choose. We're not in oblivion or in denial if somebody is doing things that they shouldn't be doing or that are hurtful. Or in some situations, of course, that as we're working with people, there needs to be boundaries even be put up because very aggressive type behaviors or these kinds of things, okay? This isn't disconnected from the very real world. We're sharing this with you because on a weekly basis as a church, not just leadership, but as a church as a whole, we're walking with people in the very real world that they're in. And we're sharing with you How you can bring this kingdom principle into your life that not only for yourself and for your family, but for those that you have contact with, you can release heaven and what God wants to do in situations if you'll agree with Him. So joy isn't just a feeling. Thankfulness and rejoicing is a choice that turns into a habit. And I have to be honest with you, this, some people seem to just be very joyful. They just have a joyful personality and they just very naturally kind of move toward Thanksgiving and they, they take things pretty easy and things come up and they're like, oh, it's okay. You know, God bless those people. <laughs> That's not normally probably where I would naturally land with some situations. And if you're like me, and that's maybe not your normally your first reaction, you can choose. And to be honest with you, even this week, there's times where I just lifted my hands. I said, Lord, I thank you in the midst of this. I thank you before I see the answers. Because anybody can praise God when you've seen the answers. Anybody can see, uh, praise God when everything's worked out just the way you were hoping. Anybody can praise God actually when things are going well and that you know, people are responding to you in a way that's honoring and you're sowing honor and you don't get honor back. You're sowing you know, love and it's actually just... Anybody can praise God though when that's being reciprocated. But Lord, I'm going to give you... That's why the Bible calls it a sacrifice of praise. God, I lift my hands to you very practically. I lift my hands to you, Lord, and before I see the answers, even though there's a lot of swirl going on in my heart and my mind, Lord, I'm going to combat that by saying, Lord, I give you praise before I see the walls come down. I give you praise before I see that pain leave my body. I give you praise, Lord, before I see that situation shift. I don't understand all these things, but in the midst of it, what I do know is that you've said to be thankful in all things. And Lord, I give you praise and thanksgiving before I see these circumstances shift and all of heaven is watching. Angels are watching. Demonic spirits are confused as you give worship literally I have seen and others have seen in the spiritual realm when you begin to give God thanks and worship it actually throws confusion into the enemy's plans he does not know what to do with that you see it actually manifest in the Old Testament armies going into confusion fighting against each other that's what's going on in the spiritual realm and it's just manifests in the natural when the armies coming against God's people they just begin to fight against each other as the worshipers begin to worship God because He's confused. He doesn't know what to do. Heaven is showing up. My plan isn't working. Retreat. It's backfiring. Because God will work in your situation. He is working in your family. He is working in your finances. He is working in that very difficult thing, that health thing that you're dealing with. And as we begin to worship, the enemy actually goes into confusion. You'll be tested. But as you stay in that place, he can't stand it. He'll retreat. Your eyes will be washed to be able to see how to properly proceed. No confusion, no anxiousness, no fear. It has no place. And I tell you what, 
There's nothing more that glorifies God than in the midst of difficulty. We offer, the, as the Scripture says, a sacrifice of praise. I believe one of the things that came to me as I was praying this morning, preparing for this message, was I believe when we get to heaven, we're going to be able to look back on these circumstances that you and I are facing that are very difficult. I realize this isn't, well, somebody took my parking stall. <laughs> Although that can be an issue. There's some neighbors that forget their address. <laughs> Serious things, though. God, I have no idea how this is going to work out. I don't know what you're doing. But if you feel you're going back and forth, kind of in the swirl between standing and believing and then into confusion and discouragement, set your course. It doesn't mean that you're always going to feel, but I don't live by how I feel. I acknowledge what I'm feeling, but I don't live by how I feel. I live according to the Word of God. And you know what? My feelings and my circumstances will follow. Complaining, as I said, releases the enemy's will into situations in an increased way. That doesn't mean you don't have honest conversations. This isn't about being in denial, as I said. But we have kind of a, a little... Uh, saying that helps us remember honor three H's honor humility and honesty honoring God and honoring the people around me walking in humility and it positions my eyes to be clear worship positions my heart to be clear my mind to be clear on how to have an honest conversation in a way that actually advances God's kingdom rather than just venting that anger that just kind of, well, you know, we throw up all over a situation verbally and don't, boy, don't we all feel better now? <laughs> Some of you don't do that apparently. God bless you. You're ahead of us in the game. Complaining releases the enemy's will into situations in an increased way. Thankfulness and rejoicing releases heaven into our circumstances in an increased way. So we have a choice. Joy is healing. Proverbs 17, 22. I love this verse. Now this verse is not some little nice little saying that's tucked into Scripture in the book of Proverbs. This is the truth. A merry heart does good like a medicine. See, when you choose to rejoice, you're releasing healing. When you choose to be thankful, Scripture says, a merry heart does good like a medicine. All of these exhortations wouldn't be in here if this was easy. All of these exhortations wouldn't be in there if really we had a very passive approach in this whole thing and God just gives us this. Sometimes we have to stand. Sometimes we get to choose. And I believe it's very honoring to the Lord, and it brings healing to us. A merry heart does good like a medicine. As I said, if you're asking the question, how do we do this? How do I have a merry heart? As a church, as part of the leadership team, as part of those in our congregation in both locations, I want us to be worshipers. At church, absolutely. But you see, when I'm worshiping here at church, this is just kind of like, this is kind of like going on a date with your wife. When Jocelyn and I get to go out, those are special times. You know why those are special times? It's because we've been doing life together. And here, this is kind of a, a special time set apart where we just get to talk, to visit, Spend time together. When we come to church and we're worshiping, this is a special time. But you know what makes it authentic? Is hopefully you're developing a lifestyle of worship Monday through Saturday. And when we come together and we're bringing that corporate sense of worship, there's a corporate sense of the presence of God that we get to step into that actually I sense God's presence a lot. <laughs> I do. Even in difficult things, I sense them. I feel him because I, I call out to him and I, and I look to him and I, I, I know that that's available to every one of us. But there's something special about the corporate presence of God that I sense when we come together. 
that I don't get the sense Monday through Saturday quite the same way. I'm not going to make a big theological statement about it, but it's what I feel. I want you to develop a lifestyle of worship, of thankfulness, of joy. In fact, just fast forwarding to a verse I have right at the very end, Proverbs 15, 15 says this, he who has a merry heart has a continual feast. Not little crumbs, not little just enough, a feast. God wants us to have a feast. So, joy is healing. Thankfulness is healing. Stepping into worship is one of the primary ways that we can practically put this into practice in our lives. At church, can I encourage you today, take a step in worship. If you've not been accustomed to raising your hands, lift your hands to the Lord. You'll feel something break in your life. When I'm worshiping, when I'm raising my hands, when I'm dancing, when I'm singing, I'm not, I'm not doing that. They're, they're, I'm doing it to honor the Lord, but I can feel the spiritual atmosphere shifting as we would worship, as we would even dance if you feel comfortable doing that or physically able to do that. As you worship the Lord, I like sitting at the front, partly because I have to come up here and speak, but I don't, I'm not watching what anybody else is doing. This is between me and the Lord. This idea of worship and thankfulness and joy being healing. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. This is one of the Old Testament scriptures that is a messianic passage. And what that means is, and there's many of them. In the Old Testament, there's many, many scriptures that speak about the Messiah one day coming. He will, he will come. And he will bring the kingdom. And this particular passage, Isaiah 61, Jesus actually quotes it when he's actually beginning his ministry. And one of the things he quotes is in verse 3 of Isaiah 61. And it says this, The Messiah will come to console those who mourn, to give them beauty for ashes. And then it says this, the oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Do you know heaviness is a spirit? It's a spirit. It'll try to attach itself to you if you let it. I'm not saying there isn't times in our lives where we properly mourn. Okay, when we lose someone... When there's something that's happened, we've, something significant has happened in our lives, there may be a time of grief and mourning, but even in that, stay thankful, stay worshipful, and it can be good grief because it will actually be healing in your life. It'll be a journey, but it can be healing in your life. Thankfulness. Oil was healing. Do you know the story of the Good Samaritan? Perhaps you've, you're quite familiar with that story, perhaps. It says this, that the Good Samaritan who stopped to help the person who was so badly wounded poured in oil and wine. There's a song, an old song that says, He poured in the oil and the wine. He found me bleeding and dying on that Jericho road. And he poured in the oil and the wine. Oil is a picture of healing. And it says this, when the Messiah comes, not only to us, but the people around us, if you're mourning here today, the Lord wants to console you. He's not looking down on you. If you say, Pastor Rob, I don't even feel, I just feel numb today. Perhaps you're here in person. Perhaps you're watching online. You're in our Moose Jaw location and you feel like you're mourning today. Draw on the corporate sense of the presence of God as we go into worship here in a moment. Receive the Lord's consolation. To give them beauty for ashes. Do you feel like things are just burnt up in your life? What could God ever do with this mess? He makes beautiful things out of it. See, Romans 8.28 says this. All things. All things. My mistakes are part of those all things. Your mistakes. Your absolute, my absolute, utter failures. 
are part of those all things. All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Not some things. All things work together for good. God can take those ashes. He can use them to make something, as it says, beautiful. And then it says this, the Messiah will come, Jesus will come, and He'll give us the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What does that do? That they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Do you want to see fruitfulness in the midst of barrenness in your life? Do you want to see fruitfulness in the midst of ashes? A tree bearing fruit? Be a worshiper today. If I could share one thing with you, be a radical worshiper of Jesus. Not as a spectacle, not as just sheer emotion. I'm not afraid to show emotion. But my emotions don't run my life. Lots of times I don't feel like doing but I'm going to choose to align myself with God's Word. And as I do that, yes, my emotions, how I feel, and my circumstances will all become aligned because I'm releasing heaven. The oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. If you're dealing with the spirit of heaviness today, you might be watching this online. Someone might even be on the verge. You feel it's so hopeless. I feel like it should take my life. You've had those thoughts swirling in your mind. Can I tell you, that's the enemy that's lying to you. Because hopelessness, hopelessness is always a lie. Because the scripture says, in Christ, God is the God of all hope. He brings hope. God wants to set us free from heaviness. Now, if you're not feeling heavy today, let's lift up the arms of those around us by being an overt worshiper this morning. If you're feeling heavy today, you know what? You are not a victim. You are a son or a daughter of the king. And the Lord wants to use the opportunity that we have to worship today to cast off heaviness. And I'll be honest with you, I feel that in situations when I choose to raise my hands and begin to worship God, begin to thank Him for what He's doing in the midst of circumstances I don't understand. I feel it begin to shift. I feel it begin to shift. I just want to share a testimony as I close. Um, I actually, when I was in Moose Jaw uh, this week at our discipleship night in Moose Jaw, we have a discipleship night in Regina on Wednesday, and we have a discipleship night in Moose Jaw on Thursday, and there's something for everybody if you'd like to come. At the start of it, we actually do a little bit of worship, and I shared a little bit of this journey, this part of my life, where for three years, I was actually hired, uh, I'm a school teacher, uh, in background, I was a school teacher, and I taught here at one of the public high schools in Regina for three years. And the first posting that I got as a teacher was actually uh, young people, kids, um, youth, 12 to 15 years old. And even though they weren't high school age, they were in a high school because it was a special uh, designated class where there was only 10 students and three of us as staff. Uh, they were designated with behavioral issues. And so you had to work pretty hard to get into that class. It was an expensive class uh, because of all of the other supports and the kids being cabbed to and from school every day. And like I said, three staff for 10 students. I don't want to be dramatic, um, but <laughs> I got offered the job three weeks into the year because um, the person who it was in that job at the time, this was many years ago, of course, the person who was in the job at the time had taught for 26 years, thought this would be a a nice way to finish his career. Just had a few years left to teach, 10 kids, two assistants. Hmm, can't be too bad. Anyway, the kids beat him up. And so he was on stress leave. And so they basically asked me if I'd go and observe the classroom and if I wanted the job, I could have it. Well, this is a time where teaching jobs were very hard to find. They saw in my resume that I'd worked with some at-risk kids. Well, what I did is I, I went and I shared the Lord and saw God touch lives. This was a very different setting. Um, I, I saw a lot of things. Some people say, well, you could, you could probably write a book on the things that went on. And th in the three years that I was there, I took away three knives, um, dealt with a lot of, you know, a lot of things. And you could feel the heaviness that many of these kids had experienced in their lives. 
you could feel the oppression. And of course, this is in a, a setting that isn't overtly Christian. But you know what? When you walk into a setting and you have a thankful heart and you will lift up the name of Jesus in the ways that I'll explain here in a moment, you, this all of a sudden becomes a Christian setting. So I'd be walking. My room was at the very farthest end of the school. It was at one of the high schools here in the city at the time. I think it had about a thousand students. And so I'm walking from the very end. I'd get there early and I'd be doing some photocopying or some preparation in the office. All the other um, rest of the school started at 8.30. Our class started at 9. So everybody was there in the office, the admin staff and the secretaries. And I'd be, I'd be doing my work in there, getting ready for the day. And I'd be worshiping. Now, they couldn't hear what I was saying because I wasn't speaking so loud that I was distracting them. But I'm singing, as the Scripture says in Ephesians 5, singing and making melody in my heart to the Lord. And I, and I don't want to, again, I don't want to be dramatic, but I'll, I'll tell you, most mornings I was on my face just calling out to God because it's very, very, it was very difficult. Very, 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 very difficult. Um, we actually had to get rid of our answering machine. That was back in the day when you had answering machines. And, you know, we actually had to get rid of our answering machine I was dealing with, you never knew what you were going to be dealing with. But in the midst of that heaviness, God gave me the instruction, Rob, bring the garment of praise. I'd be worshiping. The secretaries and the admin staff, they'd just be like, you're really happy. They know what goes on in that room. In fact, my principal at that time, he'd been in education for 32 years. He says, Rob, I don't know what you're doing down there. And so I told him, I says, we, we've taken Jesus and the Scriptures. I'm not just talking about religion and even just the Lord's Prayer. We've taken Jesus out of our schools. We've taken Jesus, uh, we're trying to take Jesus out of all of these things. It's Jesus, it's the very answer to these situations. He says, I, I, I don't know what you're doing down there. But he said, it's working. He says, I was, I was going to retire because of this, this classroom, he told me. He said, but whatever you're doing, I, says, it's, I said, it's Jesus. It's the power of prayer. Even though I don't, can't overtly share the gospel, I'd have my Bible, I'd be reading. Kids would sometimes ask me questions. Sometimes if they asked for prayer I'd, 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 you know, or were interested, I'd meet with them or their parents or whoever the situation was, pray with them. Several of those kids gave their hearts to the Lord. This classroom was often a place where um, the students go and many of them don't continue on with school after they're done because that's why it only goes to 15 because you only have to be in school till you're 16. We saw 13 kids go into regular grade 9 classrooms in those three years. Unheard of. I had an elected board member from the Regina Public School Board come down to my classroom. Now, he didn't come in. He just stood outside the door and wanted to talk to me. But um, he, he said, Rob, I just wanted to come down and thank you because... I'm just hearing tremendous things about what's going on down here. Can I tell you something? This principle that I'm talking and we're sharing about this morning from God's Word, along with the fact that although I couldn't share details of what was going on in the room and what was going on with the kids and the communication with the police and the social services and all of these kinds of things, I had people praying for those kids every day my name. And as they were praying for those kids, God was showing up. God was bringing this calm, this supernatural calm, into, into that room. And 13 of those kids went into regular grade 9 classrooms. Every morning, though, I'm singing. I'm worshiping. I'm releasing God in this place. After my assistants would leave, the kids would leave. It's been a tough day. Lord, I thank you for coming into this place and releasing, Lord, a, a, a spirit of, of, of peace instead of heaviness. See, Jesus is the answer today. And heaven wants to release Jesus in your life, in your family, in your home, wherever you work, and in your sphere of influence. He who has a merry heart has a continual feast. Will you stand with me, please? So this first song that we're going to sing in worship, in both locations as we prepare to transition to worship, talks about Jesus as the holy and anointed one. We've sung it before. I want this morning, if I could ask this, I want you to respond, not to me, of course. <laughs> I want you to respond to the Lord by being a worshiper today. I want you to respond to the Lord and say, Lord, in the midst of what I don't understand, before I see the answers, I'm going to overtly worship. Take a step that you don't maybe normally take. 
Lift your hands to the Lord. I'm going to invite the worship teams in both locations to come up, please. Lift your hands to the Lord. Can we do that as we worship today? Jesus is the holy and anointed one. That's what Christ means, Jesus Christ. Christos, in the Greek, it's the anointed one. He is the anointed one. And you know what? He anoints you and I to go into any circumstance and bring Jesus if we will actually be a worshiper releasing heaven, allowing angels to actually carry out the assignments that they've been sent to carry out on your behalf. Let's do that today as we worship. Lord, it is our great privilege to come and to give you our yes. Today we choose to do that. Yesterday's yes was for yesterday, and thanks for the grace to do that. But today, Lord, we're giving you our yes. Lord, and as we worship today, I thank you that heaviness is going to break off people. The spirit of uh, praise uh, will, and the garment of praise will enwrap itself around people and heaviness will break off in the name of Jesus. Oppression will break off. Fear will break off. Anxiety will break off. Shifts will take place in people's hearts, in their lives, and physical bodies as we become worshipers today, God. So Holy Spirit, come and lead us. Worshiping the Holy and Anointed One in the name of Jesus. Let's worship the Lord together today. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord.